Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, it's February 6, 2018, and today I'd like to introduce the topic of microbiome. And uh, if you recall back in lifestyle medicine, and I'll put a link to that video in the upper right hand corner, uh, I introduced the topic of the, the microbiome. I told you that uh, there'd be videos to cover each one of those topics, and we'll go back to that wheel in just a moment. But that's what we're going to do today. We're going to introduce the microbiome. And the way to think about the microbiome is we are a collective. And hopefully that'll make more sense as we go through. Not quite like in Star Trek, uh, the Borg, but we are indeed never alone. We have a multitude of friends with us at all times. So this is part one, and let's get started. So here's that wheel again, and the wheel represents the balance, the, 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 the supporting structures, and all of those spokes of equal length and require equal concentration to make that wheel work properly. So if in the old country, if there was a damage to a spoke or two, they'd really focus on it because they'd have a short ride, there'd be a breakdown if there was damage to one of those spokes. So when we think about lifestyle medicine, I like to think about the wheel and, and say that that wheel's uh, structural integrity is completely dependent on the, uh, those spokes, each and every one of those spokes. And each one of those spokes, I think, is a good representation of each one of these elements or factors uh, that are uh, supposedly at the end of each of these spokes. And today we're going to be talking about the microbiome in the upper right hand corner. And each one of these uh, elements, uh, you know, that whether it's sleep, exercise, microbiome, fasting, or nutrition, all of these ones around this entire circle uh, are responsible for interacting with each of the other elements here. So the microbiome is completely dependent on nutrition. It's completely dependent on the environment. Fasting has an impact on it. Exercise has an impact on the microbiome. Sleep has an impact on the microbiome. And in return, stress has, a, has, a, has an impact on the microbiome. The microbiome has an, has an impact on our emotional state, our self-awareness, our intellectual health, health. If our my, microbiome, if there's a case of dysbiosis, our intellectual health will, will suffer. Our hygiene has an effect on our microbiome. So all of these, these uh, elements, so it's, it's multifactorial. Our lifestyle approach, our lifestyle medicine is multifactorial and there's tremendous interdependence upon, amongst mul multiple factors. So that's one of the things to think about as we go through each one of these, ultimately go through each one of these, these factors on this lifestyle medicine wheel. So when we're talking about the human microbiome, we got to stop back first and say, geez, before we did the human micro microbiome, we did the Human Genome Project. So that was started in 1990 over on the left-hand side of your screen. And I think it was around April of tw uh, 2003 that the, uh, the human genome, wa the, the mapping of it was complete. I think 26,000 uh, genes were, were uh, co completed by that time. So... And then the human, microbi uh, human microbiome project was initiated. It was started in 2008. It was anticipated to be completed in 2013, but was, was closed in uh, 2012. So uh, a massive uh, undertaking, the, the, the looking through and trying to type all of these various genes within the human microbiome. So some of the the language that's used, uh, the microbiota or biota, <laughs> is the microbial organisms that make up the microbiome. And that's each one of the various kingdoms here. And then we have the microbiome. It's, it's the sum of all of the, micro, uh, the microbes that, that have their genetic information pooled together that create their, and their ecological niche, niche that make that that particular uh, microbiome. And we'll be talking about several different microbiomes within just, just a couple of moments. Dysbiosis is a state of imbalance. It's, it's where, the, where with a symbiotic state, the, the normal equilibrium is disrupted. And that's very common this day and age. That's, that's the reason that so many people have chronic debilitating disease or think that they're aging 
when indeed they're undergoing chronic inflammatory conditions, which is damaging the tissues in their bodies, from their eyes to their toes, from their nose to, 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 where, to, to their butts. So then the enterotype, it's really the classification of living organisms within biological ecosystems. So an ecosystem, examples of various ecosystems include like the, the tundra, the uh, tropical rainforest, deserts, or in our area, a cold, temperate climate. So the organisms, the flora and fauna within each of these uh, ecological areas are quite different. They, they all, they're all necessary to maintain equilibrium, so it creates a whole dynamic uh, soil food web and food web amongst all of them, the, the, the food chain as you think about them. So when we talk about the enterotype, we're talking about those back, bacteriological ecosystems within our digestive system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, it, as I mentioned early on, we need to think of ourselves as a, a tremendous collective. So if we were to do, uh, to dehydrate our stool and look at the microbes that we're talking about, they'd probably weigh somewhere between two and six, six pounds. Uh, they're composed of bacteria, fung fungi, viruses, and archaea, and those are all those various kingdoms. And then they have symbiotic relationships with each other and with us if everything is in equilibrium and we're in a good health state. There's, we're talking about 100 trillion microorganisms, and when you look at the number of cells in our body, there's probably 10 trillion approximate. These are approximate numbers. So we're outnumbered 10 to 1. Uh, if we're to say about each one of those uh, 10, 100 trillion microorganisms are complete organisms as, composed to we are, as opposed to we're a single organism. <laughs> so 90% so of the cells that, that we think about our, that are carried around on our two feet are microbial. A thousand different species, seven to 36,000 different strains. So they out, no, outnumber us 101 with genes, at least that much, depending on the population at any given time. Our, our microbiome can take years to establish. And uh, something that's concerning, one-third of the babies born in the United States are now born by C-section. So normal vaginal delivery is displayed here on the left-hand side of the screen. The baby is delivered through the vaginal uh, canal, uh, presents face down in a normal presentation. Of course, there's compression of the digestive tissues and also there's urine and feces that's around the area. And that's all good and, and appropriate because that, that child who has been aseptic with, within the uterus is now being presented to the world, the outside world. And the most important thing is becoming inoculated with the microorganisms that are from mom and dad because dad has been in that spot too. So those microorganisms inoculate the baby and that's extremely important. As opposed on the right side here, a C-section, you can see that a clinician or a nurse delivers the baby through, through the opening in, that they've created through the skin. And so they don't necessarily become inoculated unless they're really taking their time and taking a swab and taking some of the vaginal secretions and inoculating the child, which I don't think is standard practice yet. It should be. So I think there should be fewer C-sections. Uh, they're a convenience and a moneymaker, and I think that uh, more vaginal deliveries would be, would be better. However, granted, there are safety concerns that where, where C-sections are necessary, but I believe that inoculating the, the newborn babies would be something that really needs, needs to be considered early on. Another concern uh, that I believe it merits discussion, and we'll talk more about this in the future, is the lack of breastfeeding by many mothers nowadays. There's nothing better than mom's milk uh, for the human child. And uh, they produce uh, HMO, human milk oligosaccharide, a polysaccharide, <coughs> excuse me, a, uh, a non-digestible uh, carbohydrate that passes through 
the stomach and small intestine enters the large intestine and the microbes that are within the uh, baby's digestive system in the colon actually break that down, feed them, and they have that wonderful relationship, some of the things, the functions that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> so uh, we're never alone. So we have all of these different um, ecosystems all over the surface of our body from inside our oral cavity, inside our nasal cavity, our throat, uh, along our, our, the, the back of our throat, in our large intestines, the urethra, the vagina, the skin, the mouth, behind the ears, the ear canal. So we have all different populations of microorganisms that support us, that, that don't do us harm, they actually protect us. It's we have disruption of the normal protection, either from, un, from an inflammatory internal system, such as allergies and, or uh, inflammatory conditions that come from systemic illness related to our digestive system, or from abrasions, that the normal protective microorganisms on the surface of our body are no longer there and able to protect us. So, all right, so what are some of the functions of the gut mi uh, microorganisms? Well, they convert complex carbohydrates into short chain fatty acids, and that's a big topic we'll talk about in the future. They competitively inhibit pathogens, sort of like your chances, if they only had five big screen TVs at Walmart on Black Friday, your chances of getting one of those big screens if you're not right in the front of the front of the line, and of course you could get trampled. Well, that's competitive inhibition. When there's a thousand people looking for, you know, trying to get one of only five things available, well, that's competitive inhibition. So the more beneficial microorganisms that we have in our digestive system and, and the pathogens are inhibited by crowding them out. They aid in our uh, digestion of food. They aid in absorption. They balance our pH and maintain our blood-gut um, uh, integrity. So one thing to think about is our digestive system is a tube that passes through our body. When we eat something, it doesn't go into our body. It has to be absorbed through the tube. So it's like a, a, a pipe that goes under, under your house that, or a pipe that goes through your house. Uh, although the pipe is within the house, what travels through the, that pipe, the gas hopefully isn't, isn't going into your house, into the air. So that tube, it's it, essential to maintain the integr integrity of that tube, our digestive tube, from the oral cavity to the anus, maintain the integrity of that so that things that we don't want getting into our body don't get into our body, only those things that are, uh, that are appropriate for our body. Uh, the, the microbes metabolize drugs. They neutralize cancer-causing compounds. They produce digestive enzymes. They synthesize vitamins. They, they synthesize hormones. They deconjugate bile acids, which can do damage to, to the epithelial cells that line our digestive system. They, they salvage calories. They, they produce those short-chain fatty acids that we talked about that stimulate colonic blood flow, that stimulate the cells to be able to produce the, the a protective layer, the, the uh, goblet cells to produce the mucus, which is another barrier to those pathogens getting into our system. They facilitate fluid and electrolyte uptake. They, they stimulate the production of uh, butyrate, which feeds those epithelial cells that line our digestive systems. Uh, they, they produce amino acids. They synthesize vitamin K and folic acid. They participate in drug metabolism. So there's all these beneficial things that, that, are, uh, that are necessary for appropriate me metabolism in our digestive system. Well, they also facilitate good things in our, in our immune system. Our gut is one of our biggest immune organ, organs. They stimulate immunoglobulin A, part of our humoral, our acquired humoral immune system. Those are the antibodies, the first ones that get, get produ uh, produced that, that signal our other cells to be able to take out the offending agent that comes through without it being a long time and saying, oh, I don't know if you're friendly or foe yet. It's, it, it attacks them pretty early on. 
It promotes anti-inflammatory cytokines and down-regulates pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, de so cytokines are chemical communicators secreted from cells. So those chemical communicators can, can promote inflammation or attenuate inflammation. And so it, promote, it promotes anti-inflammatory. It, it promotes um, down-regulation of uh, radical oxygen intermediates. It promotes scavenging of radical oxygen intermediates. All of these things that create inflammation and damage to our tissues. It induces uh, regulatory T cells. And those T cells are part of our immune system. And these T cells circulate through the circulatory system that, 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 uh, that travels by all of these other immune cells and antigen presenting cells throughout our gut. It doesn't go into our gut, but they go around this, the, the blood supply, the capillaries that, that nourish the gut. And they're taking feedback information from what's going on with the gut. It's like the fire engine uh, horn going off. It's telling us, my goodness, there's something bad inside of this digestive system. Lots of inflammation. Well, those T cells are going to go to the rest of our body. It may go to our joints, our lungs, and all. And so we, we get the systemic effects of whatever is going on in our digestive system. So now we're going to uh, introduce Dr. Greger from nutritionfacts.org. Uh, that's a place I really highly recommend. The website is listed down below, https colon slash slash nutritionfacts.org. And uh, there's a plethora of great information. Uh, he is the, uh, the spokesperson in a sense. He's very busy all the time, but he presents these beautiful videos that summarize uh, important and relevant information that uh, over 20, uh, 20 people, including himself, 19 uh, paid staff workers, uh, do at this not-for-profit corporation that doesn't take funding from these big agency, and they screen through all of the peer-reviewed papers, and they see, is this legitimate? You know, was this sponsored by a big corporation? Is there bias? Was the study design done well? Uh, you know, a whole, they, they really scrutinize the papers to see, is this worthy of sharing with people? And they give us, he gives us great information that can impact our lives. It allows us to hack the systems. If we realize how detrimental some things are that we're consuming, well, then we can make a change in our lives to make our, our health span much better, meaning that we have a better quality of life and potentially even prolong our life as well. So uh, Dr. Greger, I'm including two videos here, and the title of one of the videos is What's Your Gut micro, microbe, uh, Microbiome Enterotype, which is, remember, that's the bacteriological ecosystem within your gut. He's going to introduce the types of enterotypes that, that you can have in your digestive system, typically. And he's going to talk about, in the second video, how to change your, your enterotype. So what we're going to do now, we're going to stop. We're going to go to those two videos because he's fantastic at, 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 at presenting this information. And then we'll come back to me in just a couple of moments. The human gut has a diverse collection of microorganisms making up some thousand species, with each individual presenting with their own unique collection. But it wasn't known whether this variation is on a continuum, or if people cluster into specific classifiable types, until this famous study analyzed the gut flora of people across multiple countries and continents, and identified three so-called enterotypes. There were people who had lots of bacteroides in their gut, people who had a predominance of Prevotella species, and people who stool instead grew out a lot of uh, ruminococcus species. Uh, pretty amazing that with so many hundreds of types of bacteria, that people would settle into just one of three categories. But they figure our guts are like ecosystems. Uh, just like there's lots of different species of animals on the planet, they aren't randomly distributed. I mean, you don't find dolphins in the desert. In the desert, you find desert species. In the jungle, you find jungle species, because each ecosystem has different selective pressures, like rainfall or temperature. Well, this early research suggests that there are three types of colon 
ecosystems. You, you can split humanity up into three types. People whose guts grow out lots of Bacteroides-type bacteria, those whose guts are better homes for Prevotella group bacteria, and those that foster the growth of Ruminococcus. And if you think it's amazing they were able to boil it down to fit everyone into just one of three groups, subsequent research on a much larger sample of people was able to fold Ruminococcus into Bacteroides. So now everyone fits into just one of two groups. So now we know, when it comes to gut flora, there are just two types of people in the world. Those that grow up mostly Bacteroides, and those that overwhelmingly are whole, home to Prevotella species. The question is why. It didn't seem to matter where you lived, male or female, how old or skinny you are. What matters is what you eat. This is what's called a heat map. Uh, each column is a different grouping of bacteria, and each row is a, a food component. Uh, red is like hot, meaning a, a close correlation between the, preven pre the presence of this particular bacteria and lots of that particular nutrient in the diet. Uh, blue is like cold, meaning you're way off. Uh, a reverse correlation, meaning lots of that nutrient is correlated with very low levels of that bacteria in our gut. They looked at uh, over 100 different food components, and a theme started to arise. This column is Bacteroides, and this column is Prevotella. Note how they're kind of opposites. When it comes to things like animal fat, cholesterol, animal protein, Bacteroides is red, and Prevotella is blue. When it comes to plant components like carbohydrates, Prevotella is red, and Bacteroides is blue. Here's a simplified version, clearly showing the components found more in animal foods, like protein and fat, are associated with Bacteroides, with the Bacteroides enterotype, and those found almost exclusively in plant foods are associated with Prevotella. So no surprise African Americans fell into the Bacteroides enterotype, where most of the native Africans were Prevotella. The reason this may matter is that Bacteroides species are generally associated with increased risk of colon cancer, our second leading cause of cancer death, yet almost unheard of among native Africans. The differences in our gut flora may help explain why Americans appear to have more than 50 times the rate of colon cancer. If whatever gut flora enterotype we are could play an important role in our risk of developing chronic diet-associated diseases, the next question is can we alter our gut microbiome by altering our diet? And the answer is diet can rapidly and reproducibly alter the bacteria in our gut. There's been growing concern that recent lifestyle innovations, most notably the high-fat, high-sugar Western diet, have altered the composition and activity of our resident gut flora. Such diet-induced changes to gut-associated microbial communities are now suspected of contributing to growing epidemics of chronic disease in the developed world, yet it remained unclear how quickly our gut bacteria could respond to dietary change. So, they prepared two diets, a plant-based diet, rich in grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables, and an animal-based diet, which is composed of meats, eggs, and cheeses. No, no refined sugars in either. Uh, they just wanted to test plant versus animal. And within just one day of the animal-based diet hitting the gut, there was a significant shift. Uh, for example, the lifelong vegetarian. What happens when you put him on an animal-based diet? Well, he started out Prevotella, like the one vegan in the typing study, but unlike everyone else, because they were eating a more standard American diet. Remarkably, the animal-based diet inverted the vegetarian's Prevotella to Bacteroides ratio, causing the Bacteroides to outnumber the Prevotella within just four days on an animal-based diet. His entire gut flora got turned on his head. 
the fact that our gut can so rapidly switch between herbivorous and carnivorous functional profiles is uh, probably a good thing evolution-wise. I mean, if you bring down a mammoth and you're eating meat for a couple days before falling back to plants, you want your gut to be able to deal. And this flexibility is manifest in the diversity of human diets to this day, but what's the healthier state to be in most of the time? They looked at a number of different factors. First, the amount of short-chain fatty acids produced. Short-chain fatty acids like acetate, butyrate, function to suppress inflammation, suppress cancer, and our gut flora on plant-based diets produced more than on animal-based diets. Other microbial metabolites such as, metabolites, such as secondary bile acids, promote the development of cancer and with a significant increase in bacterial enzyme activity to create these secondary bile acids on an animal-based diet, no surprise, significant increase in carcinogens like DCA, a secondary bile acid known to promote DNA damage and liver cancer. Microbial enzyme activity to produce the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide also shoots up on an animal-based diet, which stinks because it stinks, and uh, because it damages DNA, and has been implicated in the development of inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen sulfide is made by pathogens like uh, Bilophila wadsworthia, which is increased on the animal-based diet, again within just days supporting the link between diet and the outgrowth of microorganisms capable of triggering inflammatory bowel disease whereas the only pathogen you see more of on a plant-based diet is just a virus that infects spinach. Well, I'm back. I hope you enjoyed both of Dr. Greger's videos. And before I forget it, I just want to, I'll put a link in the upper right-hand corner of those foods that Dr. Um, Greger recommends to include in, in your daily uh, consumption and that's called the Daily Dozen. I'll put a link in the upper right-hand corner. But, uh, and another thing I really want to mention is Dr. Greger's website, which is nutritionfacts.org, and there'll be a link in the description <clears throat> for both of these videos down below. I'll be posting more videos on these topics in the future. Uh, if you like this, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Let us know about what it is that you're thinking. I'd like to build a community where we can take take personal empowerment where we can own our own lifestyle uh, i'll be doing videos about what i'm going to call biohacking where we can go ahead and take charge we can change things in our environment that'll be cost effective save money save energy save time and potentially even enhance the quality of life and cut our dependence on these outside resources that we all tend to think we we have to have but Maybe we just don't have a need to have them, and we can have a much better quality of life. So anyways, I'll stop there. Please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment. I'd really appreciate it, and share it with your friends. Have a fantastic day, folks. Bye-bye now.